So I'm happy that we have the opportunity to uh, meet again. Guta is a very important organization, as you said, because in every economy, the movements of goods and services is a very important aspect of economic progress and economic growth. And it's you who move goods all across this country to make sure that people have the supplies that they need to be able to carry out their work. And that's why we would always consider you as one of the important stakeholders in, in our economy. To move goods and services, you must have a good transport system and you must have good markets. And so I agree with you. I mean, if you consider markets, no government has built more markets than the NDC uh, government. We built because we know that markets and trading re, uh, result in economic progress. And so you go to a village, and the most important day is the market day. And people come, this one comes with yam, this one comes with kunkunte, this one comes with cassava, this one comes with bicycles, somebody is selling motorcycles, somebody is selling abubuyas and all that. And you exchange the goods and services, and the money also circulates within the community. And so we'll continue that project of developing our markets. And anywhere we see a viable market, we will make it uh, uh, pre presentable so that people will love to go there. Nobody wants to go to a market where you're walking in mud. By the time you come out, your trousers and your dress is all dirty. People want a clean, modern market that they can go and trade. And that's why we help to develop a lot of the markets across uh, the, the country. One of the things that you need, first and foremost, is a stable economy. If the economy is not stable, your businesses will not thrive. And that's why for us, we have always focused on making sure that we have a stable macroeconomic environment. And that is what we did through till 2016 when we handed over. By the time we handed over in 2016, all the economic indices were pointing in the right direction. Debt to GDP was 57%. Uh, budget deficit was 6.1%. Uh, 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 um, other indices like um, central bank financing was zero. We didn't take one single CD from the central bank to finance the budget for 2016. And it was virtually the first time in history that any government had financed its own expenditures from its own revenues. And so we had expected that when our colleagues came, they would have built on the fiscal consolidation that we had managed to achieve. We had gone into the discipline of an IMF program in an election year, knowing that it was going to restrict the way we could spend, but we knew it was um, a sacrifice we had to make for the country so that we could hand over a better economy to, I had hoped I would win anyway, but whichever government came would have a better economy. I worked on two new oil wells because we realized that we must bring in more foreign exchange. And at that time, the transition of oil and gas had started sounding because all these electric cars that are coming and all that is going to lead to a reduction in the use of fossil fuels. And so if you have oil wells and gas reserves, this is the time you must be pumping it like a madman to make as much money from it as possible. And so I fast-tracked the um, development of the 10 field, fast-tracked the development of the ENI field. And so because of that, this government earned three times more in oil revenues than we did with only Jubilee uh, field. The next thing you need uh, for your businesses to thrive is a stable forex. And so those are the key things. If it's stable, it's predictable. By the time you go and bring your goods, the CD is still where it is. But if you have a situation where every month is sliding by 1% of its value, every month it is moving, then it makes your businesses difficult. So the first thing you demand of any government is that it must manage the economy in such a prudent manner that your businesses have a predictable economic environment to be able to survive. And that is why we must not only be interested 
in buying and selling and our trading. We must also be interested in what the finance minister is doing. We must be interested in looking at the budget that is being presented. And that's why I expected that Guta would have joined us. From 2019, when we started raising the red flag, a finance minister went on a borrowing spree. And today, the result is there for us to see. In six years, he borrowed $13.5 billion from the eurobond market. And every year, our minority was saying it in parliament, you are overborrowing, you are overborrowing, this thing is going to lead to crisis. But we were the lone voices. Everybody else was quiet. Today, the debt exchange, domestic debt exchange, and all those exchanges are because of uh, borrowing too much. In four years as president, we went to the eurobond market for $3.5 billion. That's all we took. And so all the infrastructure you saw us do and everything, it was with credit of $3.5 billion. Uh, and yet, $13.5 billion. Show me exactly what has transformed in this country in terms of infrastructure. Our roads are worse. Everything is, is much worse than it was uh, before. And so we must take an interest in how the economy is managed. And we must not have favorites who, when they're in office, we all keep quiet when they're even doing the wrong thing. But when somebody else is there, we find our voices and, you know, uh, this one I'm taking a dig at you. We are sh <laughs> locking our shops. <laughs> they are my friends, but they lock their shops all the time. <laughs> and then I have to call them to Flagstaff House. We have a chat. <laughs> Before they go and open the, the, the shops, they go and open the shops again. And so we must take an interest in how the economy is managed by any government. And I'm suggesting that a finance minister will come who will do the same thing. So how do we check it to make sure that it doesn't happen again? We must put a cap on borrowing. And so if we say that our debt to GDP must not exceed 70% at any time, then we must add it to the Public Financial Management Act so that no finance minister can come and borrow above 70% of GDP. And so those are all things we must advocate. So as we're doing these things, we must be reforming the way our economy is, is managed. The president has raised so many issues that are part of what we also are considering. Expenditure, government expenditure. Even when we had entered a crisis, COVID had come and all that. Between 2021 and 2022, when the finance minister presented the budget, government expenditure had gone up by 82 billion Ghana cities. I thought that that would be a time when they would be cutting back expenditure. But it had gone up. Before I left office, Office of the President's uh, uh, budget was 700 million. How could it have ballooned to billions of cities uh, today? And so those are all things that we must take an interest in. We must take an interest in a finance minister who is doing creative accounting. He says, my uh, budget deficit is 5%. And he gives you all the glowing statistics. But what he doesn't tell you is that I owe independent power producers 1.3 billion. I've not factored it into the budget. I did a banking sector clean out. It has led to a debt of 25 billion cities. I've not factored it into the budget. The ESLA that we all quarreled about, and they said when they come, they will abolish it. When they came, they realized how important ESLA was. And instead of just leaving ESLA, and one of the advices I gave uh, President Akufuadu, the last time I talked to him before I left office, was that he shouldn't touch Esla. Because if he touches Esla, we will go back into Dumso. Because Esla was particularly formulated to address the legacy debt and current debt of the energy sector. They took it and collateralized it as an SPV. And the minister was not factoring it into the budget because he says it's not a government debt, it's the debt of an SPV. But who owns that SPV? Government of Ghana. The ESLA is a complete creature owned by the government of Ghana. And so if there's a liability and a default, who will pay it? It's government of Ghana. When the chicken came home to roost, now you've had to add the ESLA debt. And so ESLA was not part of it. Banking sector clean out was not uh, part of it. Um, um, uh, independent power producers debt was not part of it. So then he can come and say, oh, I got a 5% budget deficit. And so these are the statistics. Then he takes it on roadshow. And then the credit rating agencies too are praising him. And then he borrows more. Today, the chickens have come home to roost. And all of us are suffering for it. 
And so we are looking at stringent reforms that we can put in that will create discipline for not only our government, but any government that will come uh, in future. We have to do this for ourselves, for our children, and for our children's uh, children. COVID was a disaster, a calamity that befell us. But it was also an opportunity because a lot of money was pumped into this country because of COVID. As the Auditor General said, we received almost 22 billion uh, CDs, free money. Well, uh, IMF gave us $1 billion uh, 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 facility. They gave us another $1 billion special drawing rights. World Bank gave us almost $950 million, almost a billion. Bank of Ghana gave 10 billion uh, CDs. They took from the stabilization fund almost uh, $200 million. And so a lot of money came in, even though there was adversity. And we should have used that money to stabilize the economy. But because it was an election year, we just started awarding contracts to favorites and sharing the money any way we wanted. The point is, every economy must have buffers. And it takes a visionary leader to create those buffers. That stabilization fund, I put the money in the stabilization fund. Otherwise, when COVID hit, we had no money from anywhere. I established the sinking fund. And any time I went to the Eurobond, I took some of the money and left it in the sinking fund because I knew that we'll have to pay debts that were coming up. They came, they took the money, they paid the balance of the Kufo Eurobond, paid other debts, and after that, they did not replenish the sinking fund. So as debts were coming due, they were just going and borrowing and paying the debts. And so the debt was accumulating. And normally, you're only servicing the interest. You're not paying the principal. And so those are things that we need to uh, look out uh, for. We built the port so that we'll have the most competitive port in West Africa. And that was because volumes had grown so much that the old Tema port could no longer handle. The only efficient berth we had was the MPS berth. For those of you who remember, it could take only two ships. And so anytime I flew out of Accra, I saw a queue of ships waiting to enter Tema port. And so I called Gapua director. I said, ah, but why do you always have this queue of ships? He said, so we don't have the capacity to handle all of them. So some of them have to come and wait with cargo for about a week or more before they get the chance to come in. And that's when I challenged them to build us a new port because Gapua and MPS were partners already. So I said, government of Ghana doesn't have the money. You use your own balance sheet and look for the money and build us a port in which you are partners. Today, that port is operating. We have more capacity than it can even handle. And that is why we are sad that volumes are escaping. We must make sure that as much volume come through that port as possible. Because even the phase two, if they finish the phase two, we can handle cargo for almost five countries in this subregion because we have the capacity to be able to do that. Today, that port is earning Gapoha a lot of money. Since that port was built, Gapoha's dividends has been more than $200 million from the new port. And yet people say, I sold the port. <laughs> Meanwhile, now, the dividend Gapoha is making of that almost 200 and something million dollars Gapoha has taken, that is what you've taken $70 million out of to go and do Bankra port without a railway line. And the point is, if my container comes, why would I wait for you to pick my container on a, a truck and send it to Bankra? I'll come and clear, negotiate the charge with the articulator driver myself and take my, my, my thing. Bankra can only be viable if there's a railway line. And so we're building it just because we, we promised that we'll build it. But after you finish, how are you going to send the containers there? By road? It's the same way we do it already. So I'd rather clear my thing in terms of put it on a truck and then haul my, my cargo to, uh, 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 to Kumasi. So we need to make our port competitive. And all of us must work together to see how we can do it. One, clearance procedures must be made easier. And one of the promises I make you is that we're going to sit together with our trade ministry and we're going to look at all the fees and charges at the port and rationalize them. Those that are not necessary illegal fees, we'll take them out so that we can make things easier. 
we're, we're going to let the port work 24 hours. And it's part of the uh, strategy for the 24-hour economy. There's no reason why we can't clear our things on Sunday. There's no reason why we can't clear our things on holidays. The port is an essential service. The way that electricity company does not go on leave on Sundays and holidays is because it's an essential service. Yeah. The port is also an essential service. And so the port must continue to work every day of the week, including holidays. And so we'll do that. So that people can clear their goods as quickly as possible. Aside from that, in order to make your lives easier, we're going to license some financial institutions. And so if your container is coming and you don't have the money to clear it immediately, you will go to the financial institution to be licensed to do that kind of business in the port. It will be a specialized financial service. So you take your customs document and then take it to the institution and say, look, my cargo is coming. These are the goods I have in it. This is the duty I'm supposed to pay. You sign an agreement with them, depending on how long you want. I want a month to be able to gather the money to clear, or two months, or three months. Yeah. Government will regulate the interest that they will charge you, so that it's not excessive. <laughs> so as soon as your container is put down, they will pick up your container, they'll pay government's money to it, and they'll move your container to their warehouse, and your container will be there. And then you take your time, put your money together, you go and take your container and you go away. And so that is one of the things that we are looking at, to license special financial institutions to do that specialized service so that government will also get its money up front. There will be no problem with somebody's container uh, staying in the port, the marriage, and all that kind of thing. Aside from that, we're going to look at the issue of shipping agents. It has come up not only in this discussion, but when we met the clearing and forwarding agents and all of them, everybody complained about the shipping agents, about the fees they are charging. A lot of those fees are not being charged in other ports or any other place. The same companies are operating in other ports. They are not charging those fees. So why are you charging them in Ghana? And so those are fees that we're going to take away so that it reduces the cost of doing business in our port too. A person imported a car, and I was just looking at the charges. This is um, it's a 2023 uh, Lexus. These are the charges. 20% uh, import duty. Then, after that, import VAT. Then processing fee, then ECOWAS levy, then vehicle examination fee, then network charges, then network charge VAT, then network charge COVID. Oh, I, I, I was shocked. Then Ghana Shippers Authority, then import NHIL, then network charge NHIL. Then GHS disinfection fee. Then MOTI import declaration fee. Special import levy. Ghana export import bank levy. Ghana education trust fund. Ghana education trust fund network charge. African Union import levy. Then COVID health recovery levy. Then certification. 21. Then IRS. <laughs> you know, there, there, is, there is overage penalty by zero because it's a new car. But if it was an overage car, it means it would be 23. You know, and so I was shocked myself. And I, th I think. You know, we might, I'm, I'm, but I'm going to tell you something. And this is about taxes and levies. Yeah. President gave a very good idea and said, look, we need to spread the tax net. And the other day I was talking about it. 
I am a head of a household. Myself and Auntie Lordina live in the house with our children. People come and work in the house. Somebody comes to service the air conditioners. Somebody comes to change the lights. Electricians come. I mean, all kinds of services. And you should see the charges. For me, I don't know whether they are presidential charges. Maybe because I've been president before, they are, they are charging me more. But I'm, I'm sure you are facing the same, this thing. The least work they come and do in your house is 1,000 CDs and over. And the question one asks is, those people who are charging, you pay them in cash, they take their money and they walk away. What tax are they paying on that money? And so it means that there are a whole host of people who are making good money, but are not paying any taxes. And for most of them, they say they are in the informal economy. And so they don't register businesses, they are artisans. And so somebody came with an idea. He says, why don't we uh, introduce a coupon? And you, can, you have to pay them with a coupon so that they go and have to go and cash that coupon. And when they cash that coupon, you put a 5% withholding tax on it. The idea is just still raw, but I think that it's a step in the right direction that we should look at and see how we can bring all those work people into the tax net, plumbers, electricians, and all of them, you know. So that's something we should look at. But like he said, if taxes are too high, then compliance becomes a problem because then everybody is tempted to evade their taxes. But the problem is, if somebody comes promising you that I'm going to remove these taxes, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, the first thing you should ask him is, they have signed an IMF agreement. And the IMF agreement says that by 2028, they should increase the percentage of uh, revenue to GDP to 24% by 2028. We came from a little below 15%. With all the taxes that this government has piled on, it has brought us to 17.7%. And it is based on an agreement they have signed with the IMF. So if somebody asks, tells you, oh, when I come, I'm going to abolish this, I'm going to abolish this, and the person is in government now, ask him to go to the IMF and tell them that they're going to abolish that. Right now, our review is in danger because they also wanted to put VAT on electricity. And you know we opposed it. Yeah. So this review is going to see where they can find that money, because that money would have brought in 1.8 billion. So by now they'll be formulating another new tax that they can put on you. And so we must be careful with the promises some people are making. If they can do it, let them start implementing it now, let's see. And don't say we should vote for you before you come and implement those tax reliefs. And so they have signed an agreement with the IMF to impose those taxes. And that's not all. We are 17.7%. They have even committed the next government and said that by 2028, we should bring tax revenue to 24% of GDP. And so if you really are serious that you want to give tax relief, you can start now. If you want to do a flat rate, you can start now. The benchmark, who made them remove it? After you all complained, who made them remove it? IMF. And they could not cough. They removed it. You protested, but they removed it. And so if you ask the person, IMF, you've signed an agreement. How come you are promising to remove the same revenues that you said you raised to 24%? How come you are promising to remove them only when you are elected? And when you are elected, the IMF agreement will still be there because it's a three-year agreement. It's going to run another one and a half years after the new government comes into, into office. But we didn't sign the agreement with them, so we, we can talk about discussing some aspects of the agreement again. But you are the ones who signed this one, and you agreed with all the benchmarks in, in, in this uh, agreement. And so you have to be careful when they come making those promises. Our promise is that we're going to work with you to make your businesses better. 
all the suggestions you bring, we will sit together. And I've done it before. I have a record of sitting with them. Yeah. Many times they've come to me in Flagstaff House, you know, and I've served them coffee and tea. <laughs> <laughs> no biscuits. They, 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 they didn't give you biscuits. <laughs> So we have a track record of working together. And if your business thrives, government thrives. If your business is good, government is happy. Because then it means that people are making income and they will be happy. Let me just go quickly through import substitution and all that so that we'll just um, bring it to a close. One of the major reasons the city is suffering is because the industries that bring us big amounts of dollars have declined. You saw what, you've seen what has happened to the cocoa sector. Production has gone down um, by, this year they will struggle to pass 400,000 tons. In 2016, we made 967,000 tons. And in 2016, even at a price of 2.2,000 something per ton, we earned about 2 billion. The syndication alone brought about $2 billion. So $2 billion of uh, uh, dollars came into the economy from cocoa alone. And normally when that comes, it helps to shore up our reserves and stabilizes the currency. This year, Cocoa Board was able to raise a syndication of only 800 million. Even, not all, 400 million is from the syndication. Then 400 million, they're taking from the traders, you know, to be able to buy the cocoa. They only recently increased the price by 58%. But too little, too late. Most of that cocoa has already gone to Cote d'Ivoire and Togo and other places. And so you are not going to be able to get it to buy. Because all that time the farmers were sitting with their cocoa, you were not buying. A farmer needs the money. And so if he's sitting and you're not coming to buy, he will go walk across, he's by the border, he'll just walk across and go and sell it, collect safer, and come and melt the safer into CDs. And he makes more money. And so we're facing a shortfall in dollars from cocoa production. For eight years, this government has not done any new drilling of oil wells or develop any oil wells. What we left them is what is still producing. And some of those wells are reaching their limits. For instance, the first one, Jubilee Well, the gas and oil is declining because we've been pumping it for some years now. And so by now you should have been drilling quickly to shore up the production. That hasn't happened. And so the amount of money we're going to be getting from the oil sector is also declining because the volumes are declining. And so the only commodity that is holding the country now is gold, because gold has become our leading export. And we've become the leading exporter of gold, 88 tons a year. And so that is the only one um, holding us. And so what we intend to do is that when we come, we would revamp the management of Cocoa Board as quickly as possible, so that within one cocoa season, Maximum two, we should be able to turn uh, our cocoa fortunes around. Because cocoa was handed over to us by our ancestors. It has helped this country. It has built a lot of the infrastructure in this country. And if we don't turn the cocoa sector around and it continues to decline, the CD is going to continue to slide. And so our first priority will be to revamp the management of Cocoa Board, putting the resources to make the farmers happy. Because the farmers are not happy, that's when they go and sell their farms to Galamsey people and share the, the money. Because for the first four years of uh, Nana Kufado and Baumia's government, they did not increase the producer price. It is only recently they increased it, but even then the farmers were getting less than 50% of the world market price. And the policy is that the farmers must get at least 70% of the world market price. Because if they earn that, then they know that every year they're getting 70% of the world market price. It makes it attractive for them to go and weed the cocoa farm, and then you must give them the fertilizers. We're giving them the fertilizer free. Most of the farmers will not take their money and go and buy fertilizer. But if you give them the fertilizer, they'll apply it. And when they apply it, they'll reap more cocoa. And that's why we brought the free fertilizer program. This government came and said, no, they have to buy the fertilizer. So we're reaping some of the effects of mismanagement. Of course, there's the angle of climate change. 
but a lot of it is mismanagement. They've increased the staffing on Cocoa Board, so they're spending most of the money on administration instead of giving the money to the farmer. So we need to revamp that sector. We need to get the oil companies to start drilling as quickly as possible because, like I said, oil is facing out. By 2030, 2035, if you've not pumped your oil, you are likely not to be able to pump it. And so we must be exploring and pumping as much as possible and bringing enough uh, money in. Um, we have to enhance exports, and the um, president talked about it. And it should be enhancing exports in places that we have a comparative advantage, but also looking at import substitution. And so I don't say that we should um, be self-sufficient by uh, producing everything. But for the key things that we have a comparative advantage to produce, we must reduce the importation. And we can do that by using Ghana Exim and others to pump money into the important areas that we want to add production. For instance, rice. I mean, when I was a kid, we didn't used to import rice. My father was one of the biggest commercial rice farmers. He had a, a rice mill. He was producing rice to feed this whole country, exporting to Burkina Faso. The government gave him an export permit to export to Burkina Faso. And so we've been self-sufficient in rice production before. And we can be self-sufficient in rice production again. Uh, oil palm. Malaysians came and took the seeds from here to Malaysia. Today we're importing palm oil from Malaysia for soaps and other industrial purposes. And meanwhile, we have so much land sitting in Western region. If we give Ghana Exim and encourage the chiefs and families and give them support to plant more oil palm, we should be self-sufficient in vegetable cooking uh, oil. All the vegetable cooking oil we are selling is deodorized palm oil. And we can produce that same thing here. Wilma and Co are producing the same uh, oil here, but they don't have enough of the oil, uh, palm oil, so they're having to import the excess from uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. And so those are things we need to look at. Tomatoes. We import a lot of tomatoes. Uh, 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 fish. We import a lot of fish. Um, what, what do you call it? Sugar. And that's why somebody says onions. <laughs> no, but it's true. Until the Niger thing, I didn't know that we we're importing about $80 million worth of onions a year from Niger. And yet onions we can produce ourselves. By the way, I've started an onion farm. And so any of you who needs onions, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> give you some. <laughs> Finally, I want to encourage you. I know you are principally traders and distributors of goods. But let us also look at some of the things that we can produce locally. And so let's not just say, yeah, 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 yeah. you can be industrialist. I was speaking to a friend. He was setting up a factory. And then he, he met his friend. He said, ah, I didn't understand you who. Also, me see factory. Uh, at the year, I think I was going to do, um, I forgot, something to do with the dressmaking industry. And the person said, ah, now what are you? That's a factory, Lebanese, near India for that, a sea factory. <laughs> Let's take that perception out of our minds. You know, sometimes we sit, and before you see, the Lebanese man or the Asian man has come to set up a factory and is producing something that, I mean, we should have thought about, and a Ghanaian should have been doing it. And that leads me to my final point. And that final point is about GDP. Every year, we say that the GDP has grown by this. But the more important statistic is not the GDP. And that's what I've said when we come into office, the Ghana Statistical Service will give us what um, that uh, particular statistic I'm going to talk about is. That is the GNP. That is the Gross National Product. The Gross National Product is a component of the GDP. But the Gross National Product shows what the share of the indigenous people is in the GDP. And in Ghana, the majority, the biggest share of the GDP is in the hands of foreigners. The smaller share is in the hands of Ghanaians. Yeah. And so every year, we must publish the GNP, and government must commit to make sure that in the next four years, we move the GNP, if it is 37%, we move it at least to 50%. Yes. And we can only do that if we help you 
to grow your businesses. Finally, 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 expenditure and corruption. He hit the nail on the head. One of the reasons why you are suffering in terms of imposition of uh, revenue and taxes is because of the expenditure side. If government is raising the money and misusing it and wasting it through sole source procurement and so on and so forth, it is your taxpayers' money that is being wasted. And so we must take an interest in that. And that is why I've suggested that we're going to have an independent valuation office. It's going to be independent of government. Any sole sourcing contract must go for value for money audit to make sure that it has not been inflated. And then aside from that, <clears throat> we must make sure that we cut down on corruption, allow the anti-corruption institutions to work. If people have taken advantage of the country, they must be dealt with. And that's why I've said, when I come into office and I'm swearing in the ministers, I will give them a caution and say, hey, my friends, Ghanaians are looking up to you. Go and do your work well. If you go and Ioko or special prosecutor comes after you, me, I'm not a clearing agent. I won't, inter I won't interfere. <laughs> I won't interfere, I'll let them do their work. And so we need to work on all that to make sure that um, we make our country better. I thank you very much. God bless you.